Good evening, everyone. This is Tom Jumicello, a representative of Green Mountain Audubon and the Programs Committee. We are now at 100 participants, and that is our limit. So we're going to be waiting a couple more minutes. I will then come on and I will uh, give the structure of the presentation and introduce the speaker, and then we will begin. At the end of the presentation is when we will be answering your questions. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat and I will be taking questions in order. We'll be beginning in just a few moments. <clears throat> Okay, everyone, it is 6.30. We're going to begin promptly. It is my pleasure to give you information about this program, which is sponsored by the Green Mountain Audubon Society and co-promoted by Otter Creek Audubon Society. So tonight we have a full house and we're going to be listening to our speaker, Dr. David Hoff, who has spent the past two decades doing extensive birding and field work throughout North and South America. He has completed his doctorate at UMass Amherst, and he specialized there in animal behavior and communication. His research largely focuses on singing behavior of warblers, but he also has a love for chickadees and has dabbled in chickadee research. He now makes his home in Ripton, Vermont. Tonight, he's broadcasting from the Gary Star Studio. Most of you know Gary. And he runs a bird tour operation called New England Bird Tours. And his link to that is in the email, which was sent out by our communications chair. It will be a wonderful evening of fascinating chickadee drama. <laughs> and we hope to see you there. So for the love of chickadees, I now introduce Dr. David Hoff. Take it away, David. Well, thanks so much, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for uh, joining me tonight and for tuning in. I'm floored that there are so many of you out there. And so I have to say, Vermont is the most amazing place on earth. And for lots of reasons, but partly because it's such a wonderful community of people, especially the community of birders and bird photographers, nature enthusiasts. So I am really honored to be here and given the opportunity to uh, speak about chickadees to part of that community. And so with that, I uh, want to thank the Green Mountain Audubon Society for inviting me to give this talk and, and also to Otter Creek Audubon and for inviting me as well. This is part of their cabin fever lecture series. But of course, this this format isn't doing much to treat cabin fever since we're probably all in our, our homes or most of you are in your homes. And yeah, winter in Vermont plus the pandemic is a double whammy recipe for cabin fever. And so uh, um, I can't see any of you out there but I'm guessing there's a pretty diverse audience and some of you probably don't consider yourself bird yourselves bird watchers. You may just love chickadees and love watching chickadees at your feeder. There may be some more uh, serious birders out there, uh, people that already know a lot about birds. And so I'm I'm hoping to um, give something for everyone. I'm uh, going to keep it mostly pretty light and may dig into the the science of chickadees a little bit. And, and I hope everybody walks away having learned something new about chickadees. And so I, along with the diversity of audience, I have to say, you know, um, there's so many different ways in which people enjoy birds and so many different modes of birding. And I, for example, sometimes will go out and try to find as many species as I can in a single day. Or I might go out looking for rare species or, um, or new birds for my life list. And when doing that, it can be 
easy to tune out chickadees because they are, of course, one of the most common songbirds around. Um, but I find that I get the most enjoyment out of really digging in deep and looking closely into a single species and that there's just so much can, that can be learned about any, any one species. And that's pretty much true of anything in nature that the, the closer you look, the more you learn. And, and so as Tom um, mentioned, I want the speed, uh, the birds that I tend to watch closely are uh, the warblers. Oh, I'm having an issue with my slide. Um, the warblers, and especially this one, the black-throated blue warbler. And I've spent years uh, all through the spring and summer watching nothing else but these birds. And I can watch a single bird for two or three hours at a time and um, never get tired of it. And so the same is true for chickadees. I uh, spent a lot of my winters doing little other birding than watching chickadees at my feeder. And I've learned an incredible amount about them in, in, uh, in doing that. Um, so, and also I have to add that um, there's a mountain of scientific research that has been done on chickadees. And we have learned so many fascinating things about these birds, but there are still so many things we don't, we don't understand about them and so much more to learn. Um, so I just want to revisit my um, title slide for a second, and just to kind of qualify the title, which is the fine line between friend and foe. And I'm a very conceptually oriented person, and I like to have a theme running through my talk, and I like to illustrate broader concepts about ornithology or animal behavior um, when talking about certain species. And if there's any theme running through this talk, it's this fine line between friend and foe, or as I like um, to say, the fine line between cooperation and conflict. And when it's easy for us to look out, at, look at the world, look to nature and see this harmonious world and animals getting along and working together and cooperating, whether it be mates or parents and offspring or family groups or just groups of animals. But when you, do look closely, and um, what you see is that there's an undercurrent of conflict that can run, um, run amongst these seemingly cooperative situations. And, and I do feel bad about uh, revealing this about chickadees. And, and so I do have to give a little bit of a warning. And um, because chickadees are so cute, and everybody loves chickadees. I love chickadees. There are and people love them because they are a, adorable, innocent-looking songbirds. And I have to give the warning um, that this presentation could potentially alter your perception of the black-capped chickadee, for better or for worse, and is perhaps not for the faint of heart. So proceed with caution. If you prefer to retain your current image of chickadees as adorable, innocent little birds, you may want to consider, you may want to reconsider watching. And so some of you may find this presentation to be rated R. And all right, so one thing I forgot to add in there is that I had an ornithology student who referred to chickadees as America's sweetheart. And I, loved it. it. I loved this label for them. And I think about it all the time and, and often refer to them as America's sweetheart. So anyway, moving on, jumping into the talk. This is a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm first going to talk about winter flocks and kind of the social dynamics that goes on in these flocks. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about a winter banding project that I did for a number of years and then switch gears into talking about 
communication, territoriality, and breeding behavior, which are three very intertwined big topics that are very close to my field and main interest. And, and then I'm gonna end the, the talk um, telling you about an interesting observation that I had with chickadees. And um, I'm pretty excited to tell you about that. All right, so jumping into winter flocks. Most of you or many of you probably know that chickadees are often found in groups during, especially during the winter. And we call, we call these groups winter, winter flocks. And there are a lot of interesting things about these winter flocks. Well, first, first of all, they're not really that big. They're not huge flocks like you might typically think of. Um, in flock for flocks of birds, there's only there's about three to twelve individuals in a flock with about an average of eight. Um, and interestingly, these flocks are composed of unrelated individuals, so they're not family members. These are not family groups, and um, the birds are unrelated to each other. Although mates that paired together during the breeding season will stick together and, and they'll, they'll uh, stick together in the same flock during the winter. Uh, so the way that what this looks like when you're, the breeding season has, is winding down and getting into the fall is that um, in the late, say late summer, August, September, uh, adults are still, can still be feeding the juveniles and you will still see family groups around. I'll often see uh, parents feeding young even through September. Yeah. But at a certain point, the, the parents will start being aggressive to the young and chase, chase them away. They start you know, attacking them and chasing them. And this happens in a lot of songbirds. And ultimately the juveniles leave and they, dis they disperse, which is an important component of the life cycle and of many organisms' life cycles. And because dispersal prevents uh, individuals from inbreeding, from young breeding with their parents or uh, siblings breeding together. So the young will disperse, but mates will stick together. And um, so, uh, they'll stick together and they, they start flocking up with other adults that they had been together with during the previous winters. And so adults will get back together, juveniles take off, look for flocks to join, and these flocks will then recruit new juveniles in the fall. And there's constantly turnover with um, adults dying every year and new juveniles coming into the flocks. Um, and also a really interesting note that, about this fall time is that um, mate pairing occurs during this fall period that the mates will stick together into the flock and then juveniles will pair together or paired with an, um, an adult that has lost its mate. So pairing happens in the fall. And these, the flocks, as I alluded to, are, well, actually I didn't allude to, but they're very stable through the winter. And in that these are in assemblages that are, you know, joining every day or there's a lot of jumping around. It's pretty much the same group of birds that stay together through the winter. And they're pretty stable from year to year with all the adults, for the most part, sticking together and new ju juveniles being recruited into the flock every year. Um, and of course, the benefit of birds flocking like this or staying together is that um, is protection from predators. There are more eyes to look for predators. They can warn each other of predators. Um, and also they can help each other I, locate food sources and um, alert each other of food sources. So one, one final interesting note about flocks is that um, the birds in them form a dominance hierarchy. And, um, and I'm going to talk about this in 
a little bit more detail. So you have these flocks, and by the way, these flocks aren't necessarily tight, tight groups, um, as probably a lot of you know that have seen chickadee, you know, watch them in the in the field. Um, it could be, you know, five, six, seven, eight uh, birds, you know, kind of dispersed throughout a tree, um, but they do kind of uh, stick together in that unit. So um, the the dominance hierarchy, they, um, when these flocks form in the fall, they kind of settle out who is dominant over who. And so they might um, number themselves, I guess, you know, one, two, three, four, through whatever. And, and the most dominant birds, say one, will be dominant over all the other birds in the flock. And number two, the second rank, highest ranking bird will be subordinate to number one, but dominant to all of the others. And these dominance hierarchies are kind of hashed out uh, by re repeated interactions with each other during the fall when they're, when they're forming these flocks. And um, often it involves a lot of aggression, fighting, and <clears throat> figuring out who is superior to who, but also there's a lot of communication that goes goes into this, that birds are um, size each other up and assess each other through means of communication. Um, <clears throat> so what does it really mean to be in a dominant hierarchy? And um, essentially it, it mostly has to do with feeding, that dominants get preferential access to food. Subordinates will yield weight or submit to dominance, and dom um, dominants will displace, chase, or attack subordinates for access to food. Um, but maybe less intuitive is it also relates to predators, that dominants are more risk averse. They show less risky behavior. They'll are less likely to feed out in the open, they feed in safer places. They're also less likely to give alarm calls or they alarm call less. And, and, and lastly, um, subordinates will mob predators more intensely. And mobbing is when a bunch of birds will get in the face of a predator trying to deter it from the, the area. And, and for example, uh, Northern Shrike is a, you know, it's a songbird, but it's a vicious predator, especially of other smaller songbirds. And birds will mob it when they are, um, when a shrike, when they spot a shrike. And, but it's mostly the subordinates doing the, the mobbing and the dominant birds are hanging back and letting the, the subordinate birds do, do the dangerous work. So, a few other notes about these uh, hierarchies is that who becomes dominant? Well, um, in relation to sex, it's um, the male, all of the males dominate all of the females. So the males will essentially fight it out, um, figure out one, uh, one through five or whatever, and all the females will be ranked below all of the males. And actually the females, Kind of inherit the rank of their their male mate that the the um, female paired to the number one ranking male will then will become the highest ranking female. Um, so also, as you might expect, age is is a factor. That older birds tend to dominate younger birds, and the yearlings that are born in the summer get dominated by second year and older birds. And, however, it's not quite uh, that um, straight of a story in that a, a certain percentage, about 20 to 30 percent of uh, yearling birds, birds in their, going into their first winter, actually attain a dominant status. So um, while age is a factor, it, it really comes down to kind of the quality or general superiority or strength and fighting ability and quickness, 
a nutritional state or the factors that might uh, figure into some birds being more superior over others. Um, so that's a little bit about dominance hierarchies. And I think getting back to the theme of cooperation and conflict, uh, this situation and um, these birds are kind of getting along somewhat. The subordinates will wait for the, the dominance to feed. And, but there's still some fair amount of aggression. The dominance will continuously exert their, their dominance over the, the subordinate birds. They'll attack them, chase them. And there's a, there is a, some degree of constant fighting, but it's a much more peaceful and civil situation than if it were just rampant, full-on fighting um, over, over food. Um, so I'm going to uh, now switch gears a little bit to start talking about so dabbling into chickadee research that I did during winters in, uh, when I was early on as a graduate student. So I um, started uh, color banding chickadees and actually at my house in the, the property that I lived on and would put these you know, colored bands. This one has a pink and a white. And, and that way I could tell every individual apart by their, their colors. And by the way, I did this, this project with my research partner, Nicole Hazlitt, who really deserves a lot of the credit for, for this work. And so <clears throat> we banded a lot of chickadees. And of course, one of the questions I had in doing this at my house which is a question that a lot of people have, I think, um, which is how many chickadees are coming to my feeder? And, and, and what I found, the answer to this question kind of f floored me. It was a lot more than I expected. And in about four winters of doing this banding, we banded about 350 chickadees, which I thought was an incredible number. And th this averaged to about 88 new birds per year. And, and a lot of those were, became regular daily visitors to the feeder, somewhere between 55 and 77 were daily visitors with uh, probably about 65 on average was, the number of chickadees that would visit the feeder every day and usually in the first hour of the day. So 65 chickadees, different chickadees in an hour, a lot more than I would have uh, expected. And I suspect that this is the case for a lot of people's feeders, that you may see only five or 10 at a time and but they're very challenging to count because they're constantly coming and going. And there are probably a lot more chickadees coming to your feeder than you think. Um, so also we would roam around the general landscape um, watching these feeders or watching these birds away from the feeder. This is the landscape of where I lived and um, just see, it's largely forested, kind of uh, patchwork of hay fields and some houses. And what we found, we never saw our chickadees all that far from the feeder. That the um, there's the house, and the furthest we saw them was about 400 meters. Once we got outside a radius of about 400 meters, all of the chickadees were unbanded. So. That's a pretty high concentration of chickadees, about 65, say, coming to the feeder, all within that 400 meter radius. There was one exception, and that is that we would, um, there were a couple other bird feeders in the area, and we would go spy on those bird feeders to see if any of our chickadees were coming to the, coming to the feeder. And we did find one of 
are banded birds at a fear about one time um, only about 700 meters away, which is still less than half a mile. Um, so another thing we were able to do while, while watching these birds away from the feeder is determine which individuals were in the same flocks together. And um, for example, we had a flock that was known as the Red Pack, which is actually named after this brand of canned tomato products. Um, and also because some of the prominent members of the uh, flock had red collar bands. And, and by the way, I'm not endorsing this, this product. And so some other kind of things that I thought people would be interested to hear about these banded birds is not too surprisingly, they all had their own individual personalities. Some, some birds would be really timid, some would be more aggressive. They'd have their own kind of subtle little movements, ways that they would get seeds from the feeder. Some would perch on the edge and bend over for a seed. Some would kind of get both legs up there, um, stick their head in. Some would, would never come to the feeder and only went to the ground, and some did neither. And so there was lots of differences from individual to individual. And, but another thing that we were able to do was um, figure out the dominance relationships between the birds coming to the feeders. And we did that by watching them interact at the feeder. And there's several ways which they might interact that, um, uh, you could conclude that one bird is acting more dominant to another, and we would score them as winning and losing interactions. For example, one might displace another one, or even chase or attack it, or give an aggressive vocalization at it. Um, and likewise, some might wait for another to feed or yield to um, a more dominant bird on, on the feeder, or they could give a submissive posture. Um, so here's some quick video clips uh, of these birds interacting at the feeder. And um, uh, I'm gonna go through a few of these. So of course this starts out with a Titmouse on here. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And I'm going to try to call out some of the things that are going on. So, <clears throat> bird's going to land on here and be aggressive. Right there. He, um, and I think I'll, I'll bring that back. This bird with a blue color band right there. Uh, another bird lands on the feeder and chases them off and actually vocalizes at the other bird, although uh, I don't think you can hear the, the sound. Right there. So we would score that as a, um, you know, him win winning that interaction or being dominant. Um, um, Sorry, this uh, I'm a little technologically challenged, and I wasn't able to uh, clip out these these clips. Um, so here's a little bit more. I think you're you're going to see one of these submissive postures coming up pretty soon. Right, right there. This spur that landed on the feeder is giving a submissive posture. They kind of duck down in this sort of like chin up like position and turn their head away from the other bird. So there's a bird on the feeder and this bird is giving a, the submissive posture to them. And, and I think you'll see a, 
almost immediately after this, there'll be a couple birds on the feeder and another bird will land in and displace them and kind of clear them out of the way. And I don't know if that was too fast for you to see us. I'll bring it, bring it back. Is in the feeder, there it goes. He just kind of clears the feeder. And this bird, as it turns out, is one of the most aggressive birds coming to our feeder. And notice how he turned around facing away. He would actually do this and kind of attack um, any bird that would try to come to the feeder. So <clears throat> very aggressive bird. Uh, just a couple of other quick clips that I want to show. Um, Uh, so there is one of these aggressive calls that this this bird just gave. It seemed like this other bird didn't actually respond to it, but. <laughs> is giving an aggressive call. Now, oh, bummer. Um, Okay, now what I wanted to show in this one, this bird up here on the top waits for these other birds to feed before it visits the feeder. This is probably a, a submissive, very submissive bird doing this. A lot of this, and he finally, goes down and gets a, gets a seat. All right, so that's all I'm going to show for these videos. Sorry for the technological issues there. And so we watch the feeders and score these interactions. And sometimes they would happen so fast, you couldn't write fast enough to uh, record them. And we ended up, scoring about 3,500 interactions per year. And this allowed us to calculate a winning percentage of every bird coming to the feed, coming to the feeder and then rank them. And since we didn't know exactly who was in the same flocks together, um, we lump them all together and just rank them one through whatever. In this case, 51, 51 birds that we had enough interactions to be confident that we captured their rank. So number one bird uh, down here with about 87% wins and all the way down to 51, number 51 with only 8% wins. And pro these birds down down towards the bottom of the rankings are likely the the females and all right so i'm going to revisit this a little bit later on in the talk and switch gears a little bit to um, talk about communication territoriality and breeding which is some of, which are some of my favorite topics and relate related to a lot of the research that I do with with warblers. Well, I just want to see how I'm doing on time here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so starting off with vocal communication, uh, uh, communicating through sound, essentially, and this is a huge topic and hot topic in the field of animal behavior. And what um, we are finding is that um, animals produce the, what we call communication signals. And those signals are 
rich with information. They are communicating a lot of information and uh, about both the bird producing the signal and or about something about the environment. And a lot of the study in this field involves um, figuring out what kind of um, traits serve as communication signals and what kinds of information those traits are conveying and, and why they convey that uh, particular information. So chickadees have very complex uh, communication, a very complex communication system. And um, I'm barely going to have time to scratch the surface of this, but I'm going to talk about three main vocalizations that they do. The chickadee call, the gargle call, and their song. Now the chickadee call, a lot of you I'm sure know it. It's the namesake call. Sounds like chickadee dee dee dee. I'll pl play a few for you. And if you don't know it, and it's a it's an easy one to learn. So here it is. And they this chickadee call, they can vary quite a bit. Sometimes it doesn't have um, the the whole chickadee dee dee part. Sometimes it's all D's and no chicka. And here's an example of that. It's just D, 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 D. And sometimes it's mostly chicka and maybe one or no D. So use one more example. And so those are some examples of chickadee calls. And what people are finding is that these calls vary a tremendous amount that um, they can combine the components of these calls in oh, essentially an endless number of ways and different ways of combining them can convey different information. And most notably, I'm not going to say a lot about them, about this, but the calls that are more rich in the chicka part um, have more to do with food and actually alerting others that um, there is food near, nearby or that, that, that um, they have located food. Um, and the Ds are essentially an alarm call and alerting others that there's a predator nearby. And, and there's, there's been some amazing research about the um, alarm call function of, of the chickadee call. And essentially the more the, the call contains information about the type of predator that's around. And the more Ds in the call, the more threatening of a predator there is. And so a call that has a lot of Ds, like chickadee, dee, 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 and there's probably a very threatening predator, like a sharp shinned hawk or a, screech owl or northern shrike and but calls that have fewer d's there might be a less threat threatening predator like a red-tailed hawk or great horned owl things that are less likely to kill kill a chickadee um, so next is the the gargle call and these are really short explosive little bursts of sound and um they sound, they have a very liquidy or gargly quality, it's very appropriately named. Here's a few examples. And, and every bird uh, produces a whole repertoire of these gargle calls, up to 12 different versions of the gargle call. So I'll play a few examples. Here's one where several gargle calls are given in succession. And there's actually three different versions given. And one final variant. So there's the gar gargle call. And the gargle call is the most aggressive vocalization a chickadee could give. It's a very threatening signal. And if a chickadee 
gives a gargle to another chickadee, it's essentially saying, um, get out of here right now or I'm about to kick your butt. And, and, um, <clears throat> and also the more different kinds of gargle calls birds give seems um, like the more aggressive they are or are going to be. So these gargle calls are the calls that you heard in those videos and the calls you probably hear when you're watching your bird feeder and there's some aggr aggression at the feeder that birds will produce these gargle calls. And, but they're also used in a, in a variety of the most highly escalated uh, conflict situations of, of chickadees. All right, so now moving on to the song, which is often referred to as the Phoebe song. This is a, a little confusing because there's a, a bird called the Phoebe, and but the the song sounds like which song of the chickadee sounds like Phoebe, Phoebe. Of course, I can't sing it nearly as well as they can. And, and other mnemonics for this are, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie, or cheeseburger. Uh, but I, I prefer Phoebe, and that's the term you, used in the, the literature on chickadees, believe, uh, believe it or not. So here are, um, here's what it sounds like. And actually, I have this kind of possibly potentially scary looking figure up here. Um, and this is a spectrogram. And I realize I should explain just a little bit uh, about what this is showing. And don't worry at all if um, you don't follow this. It's not super important to um, the message I'm trying to convey. So the spectrogram shows the, the pitch of the sound um, over time. So it's essentially like reading music. And, and so these calls are, um, are, there's two separate notes and actually the second note is, is broken into two, but that can be challenging to hear. So it's one note that's pretty much an even pitch dropping a little bit and, and then a little drop, another drop in pitch for the second note. So here it is. All right, so um, that's what it sounds like. And, and chickadees use this in amazing ways in singing this song. And, and most of you probably know that songs of birds are very much associated with the breeding season, with breeding. And the spring, when our migrants are returning, that's when we hear a lot of songs. And the chickadees, they could sing the song any time of the year, but they really ramp it up getting into the spring. And, and actually, they're, they're starting to ramp it up quite a bit right now. And the, the further and further we get into spring, the more and more Phoebe songs that we'll, we'll hear. And to, um, yeah, so talk to talk about how the Phoebe song actually functions. Uh, I just wanna say a little bit about territoriality, which is that the, as birds are bre um, beginning to breed, they defend territories. And chickadees will, the flocks that were together in the winter, they completely break up. And so each individual will start defending its own territory against all other individuals, including its own flock mates. So birds that were together in flocks that may have kind of been friends during the winter um, can actually turn into bitter enemies once the breeding season hits. And I say bitter enemies because th this, um, 
territory establishment is a full on battle from start to finish of the breeding season. They're constantly fighting over territorial space and um, the boundary areas, trying to gain access to more resources for raising their young. And it's a constant competition. And song is the great mediator of this conflict and of territory of territory defense. As birds are um, singing, they'll kind of patrol around their territory, announcing, you know, I'm occupying this space, you know, don't come any closer, um, I'm here, etc. And birds can engage in interactions, singing interactions or duels, and kind of battle out with their songs. And, <clears throat> yes, and I should add that most people probably think or would say that song, the songs of birds function to attract mates, and that's absolutely true, um, but remember these birds have already paired in the fall. They pair in the fall, yet once spring hits, they're singing a lot, and most of that, or part of that, is to announce territorial space and to defend territories. Um, so I said <clears throat> these birds are already paired, but mate attraction still continues through the entire breeding season. And that's because birds will um, potentially sneak off and mate with their neighbors. So any one male <clears throat> um, who may already have a mate that we would call their social mate um, could potentially attract any female around them that to sneak off and to mate with them. And so every male is in this struggle to pass on as many of their genes as possible to produce as many offspring as they possibly can. Um, and actually just a little example about that. Um, I'm, I'm starting to run low on time, so I, I might need to jump ahead a little bit, but um, I'm going to show you a little example in not chickadees, but black-throated blue warblers. And this territory map happens to be for some black-throated black blue warblers that I've been studying. And this bird up here that was known as ape, because he had a band combination of aluminum, yellow, pink, he was really a stud. And he fathered offspring in a lot of other males, in the nests of a lot of other males. For example, he fathered three of four nestlings in Rab's territory. He also fathered one down in Oga's territory, and two out of three nestlings in Yoga's, Yoda's territory, and one of the nestlings in Orr's territory. So this bird, Ape, he also fathered like eight of his own nestlings and as well as all the nestlings in these other <clears throat> uh, other territories. And so he was really successful. And on the other hand, um, some of the male, some males don't um, father any of their own offspring. So the, the breeding season and song is a constant battle, not just for territorial space, but for also um, fathering of the of the offspring. Um, yeah, so the Phoebe song um, plays a huge role in, in this, and there are many ways in which females uh, assess the, the Phoebe songs of males when they're choosing, um, choosing uh, who they want to father their offspring. Um, and one way in which they do that the um, males can shift shift this Phoebe song up and down in pitch. They shift the entire song either up or down, and some males are better at it than others. And males that are especially good at, at 
doing this are superior males and female can pre prefer to mate with them. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about the this Phoebe song. It's um, it's actually just the tip of the iceberg, but in the interest of time, I'm going to have to move on a little bit um, because I wanted to make sure that um, I had time to <clears throat> tell you about this observation that I was really excited to tell you about. So this is something that happened at the beginning of the breeding season as the flocks had broken broken up and males were starting to defend territories and they were just beginning to nest and um, to make their nest, uh, which they, they make their own holes in trees to nest in. And they were just starting to excavate these holes. Um, and I love finding nests. It's one of my favorite bird watching endeavors is to look for nests. So one spring day, Nicole and I went out in hopes of finding chickadee nests. And we had already found a couple in the days, in the days just beforehand. So we knew these birds were, were beginning to nest. So we went out looking for some. And when we went out, it was actually pretty dead. We didn't even hear or see any chickadees for quite a quite some time. We, we walked um, from the house, this whole edge where there's often um, several chickadee nests and got down into this corner. So somewhere down in this corner, we hadn't even heard a single chickadee um, until we heard this explosion of gargle calls, of these gargle calls um, that sounded like something was really going down. And that sounded like it came from this area uh, into the, in the forest. So we pretty um, quickly and as quietly as we could kind of shot in there into the, into the forest, um, hoping to see what was going on and maybe to find a pair of chickadees excavating a, a nest cavity. Uh, but once we got in there, it was uh, totally silent. Um, we didn't hear any, anything else or see any chickadees, and initially at least. But then um, one chickadee popped up that we saw, and it was banded, and we happened to know that it was a female. So this female popped up, but she pretty much immediately um, flew away and was gone. And then again, we were left with nothing with silence, we weren't hearing or seeing anything, um, except we heard some rustling in the leaves some distance away, maybe 10 or so meters away. And we didn't think much of it at first, like it might be a squirrel or a chipmunk. And, but we then heard a gargle call come from the spot of where the rustling was coming from. And so we approached a little closer we, um, to where that had come from. And when we did that, we um, saw another, a chickadee pop up from that spot. And this bird was also banded. And we happened to know that this was a male. So this bird perched really close to us, only a few meters away for, you know, several moments and, and then returned back to the same exact spot that it had just flown up from. And we saw that this bird was pecking at something on the ground or pecking at the ground. It looked like a chickadee pecking at a seed that it just took from your bird feeder. And so it was pecking at something on the ground, but we couldn't see what it was pecking at. Um, so we moved a little bit closer and we eventually could see that the bird was pecking at another chickadee. And, and we watched it there pecking at, an, at this other chickadee for a few minutes. 
and, and disbelief and not being able to make sense what was going on. And the, the chickadee that was on the ground, it was sort of face down and had its wing kind of splayed out a little bit. And the chickadee on top was pecking a lot underneath the wing and also pecking at the head of the chickadee on the ground. And we watched it do this for a couple more minutes. And then we approached a little closer and, and flushed the bird away again. And, and then we went and approached the bird on the ground and we could pick it up, we could pick it up and it was dead, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it, it, its body was still warm. So it had just died. And actually, as it turned out, this was my favorite chickadee coming to the feeders. Um, and Nicole instantly started crying, believe it or not. We loved this, this chickadee and couldn't believe that it had, uh, it was dead. Um, so what, what, what do we think happened after kind of putting it together? Um, we think that these birds were on their territories, defending territories, and a major fight broke out. And one of the birds was able to pin the other one down and then pecked it to death. Um, and so, other words, we came up with a verdict that America's sweetheart is guilty of murder. And this was all very disturbing uh, to us, although we also weren't completely surprised because we know, you know, the aggression that these birds are you know, kind of capable, capable of. So um, one bird had appeared to have killed another. And I was actually so fascinated by this observation that I published a paper about it in a scientific journal called the uh, Journal of Field Ornithology. And the title of the, this paper was Mortal Combat, the, an apparent intraspecific killing by a male blackout chickadee. And intraspecific just means within species. And, and one, one of the reasons I wanted to publish this paper is that from the work we had been doing with chickadees, we could put together a lot of information about the circumstances surrounding this incident. And so I'm going to mention some of those things. And, um, and to do this, I'm going to refer to these two participants as the murderer and the victim. So one thing that we knew is that these two birds were flock mates. They were in the same winter flock during the previous winter, which happened to be the red pack. So they were both members of the red pack. Um, so here they were kind of getting along or you know, cooperating to some degree during the, the winter, but became bitter enemies to the point of fighting to the death once the breeding season rolled around. Um, also, we knew that in, pre in the previous breeding season, these birds were territory neighbors of, of each other, that, and they, their territories were in this area where we observed the interaction <clears throat> and, or observed this incident. And we also knew that the female that we had seen earlier was paired to the victim. It was the victim's female. And, and so we think what was going on, these two birds were fighting likely in a territorial dispute, possibly over the, the border area here. And this major fight broke out. Um, but an even more likely situation is that the murderer probably intruded into the territory of the victim in um, looking to mate with the victim's female. And then this fight broke out and the murderer was able to pin down the, the victim. Um, so when we look at 
the dominance ranks of these birds it was very in interesting. These were two very dominant birds. They were actually ranked number four and number five uh, out of say the 65 chickadees that were coming to the feeder. So the, the victim was, was definitely no slouch. And um, they were the top two dominant birds in their flock. And, and the victim in particular was one of the most aggressive chickadees coming to the bird feeder. And actually the one video clip that I showed you earlier with the bird, um, displacing the others and then turning around ready to attack any other bird that approached. That was actually the victim. So victim was a very aggressive and dominant bird as, as was the murderer. Um, and they had, they were very evenly ma matched. They had a very um, almost identical winning per percentage. So we think these birds were evenly matched and um, how, however, do, the murderer actually won the vast majority of interactions directly with the victim. So we think that he was, he may have actually been um, dominant uh, uh, to, the, to the victim. But another interesting aspect is that if we looked at the dominance ranks in the winter before this one, and there was a little different story. The victim was the second highest ranking chickadee of, of all the birds coming to the feeder. And the murderer was very modestly ranked and very modest winning percentage of over 59%. And so we um, think that there was a takeover in dominance that occurred uh, here, which is, is very rare. In, in these chickadee hierarchies that when a subordinate bird is able to uh, move up in dominance, it's typically not by overtaking um, you know, uh, living and um, living dominance. Um, so also I, I can't really help but um, be actually even a little uh, disturbed by the the violence of what happened, and especially that the this the the murderer after we had flushed him the first time he returned returned to the victim a second time to continue pecking at him, and he kept pecking as if um, to to make sure that it was dead. So it was really brutal, <clears throat> brutal thing to, to witness. Um, and uh, this, though, although it may come surprising to many of you, um, is probably more common than we think in songbirds. And I've, for example, have done a number of experiments with the warbl with warblers and presenting them with uh, taxidermic mounts, actually. This is the mount over here, and this is a bird that's defending their territory. And they will very frequently violently attack the mounds and even land on them and start pegging them. And this particular bird just kept coming back, landing on the mount over and over again, no matter how many times we had flushed him away. away. And I've seen some birds essentially um, peck on, at the mount until they remove the head and they'll start tearing out the cotton. So th these birds on, terri on territory are, are very, are out for blood, essentially. And th that um, it's a very extreme level of conflict in um, how the breeding season pans out in the establishment of space and in the, the struggle for mating with, with the females. Um, so I have to say I hate ending on such a kind of a morbid note um, on such a wonderful bird and, and 
my hope is that, uh, and I think one thing that this observation kind of teaches us is that there's a lot more going on in the lives of these chickadees than meets the eye. And I hope you gained an, uh, somewhat of an appreciation for that and all the things that are going on in the, the social dynamics of these of these birds. And I also hope that you can observe some of the things that I was, I've been talking about at your feeders or when you're watching them or listening to them singing, getting into the, the breeding season and with these dominance interactions of the feeder and the, the vocalizations, et cetera. Um, so with that, I uh, just want to thank some people, especially uh, Jane Ogilvy and Tyler Pocket for um, providing their photos. Uh, this is a photo of, of Jane, Jane's, who, um, who goes by Green Mountain Photos. And she's a wonderful person, wonderful photographer. So I'm very grateful for the photos uh, um, to use in this presentation. And also to Green Mountain and Otter Creek Audubon Society, Gary and Kathy Starr for letting me use the internet at their house because it's too uh, too slow potentially where I live. And also to Nicole Hazlitt for uh, being part of this project and a good friend, Keenan Yukola, who gave me a lot of feedback on, on some of this stuff. Um, all right, so I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have out there. And questions there are. Um, now the participants cannot uh, ask their own questions, so uh, they have typed them into the chat. So if anybody okay. else has a question, you can type it in the chat and I will take them in order. So we have about five or six questions. Here we go. <clears throat> um, the first one I think you answered, but I will ask it as it was the first question posted. Do you band the birds you study? Um, yes. So no, not always, and it depends on the project or, or what I'm doing, but at, at least for the black-throated blue warblers that I've um, been studying for years, I have banded um, all of them for many years. I've, I've actually, in more recent years, I've stopped doing as um, much banding as I, as I used to. And for them, mainly because the types of type research that I've been doing hasn't needed uh, birds to be banded as much. That leads into the second question, and that is, how do you catch the birds to be able to ban them? Ah, I thought that that might be a question. Um, I didn't. I didn't men mention that, and people people often wonder how I catch them to ban them. So for the chickadees and for songbirds in general, I use the uh, nets that are uh, called mist nets. And it's a very fine thread that um, the birds are actually can't see very well. And we string the net between two poles and birds might fly into the net and, and you take them out and can ban them. And, and let them go. I know uh, some people use certain types of traps to catch chickadees, but we did this all using these mist nets. Thank you very much. The third question is, um, do you think that the submissive behavior is learned or innate? Ah, it's a great question. Um, well, I, I think it, it definitely is learned or develops um, through during the bird's life. And that is, birds aren't necessarily born being dominance or submissive birds. And some bird, and birds that are initially subordinate and exhibit these submissive behaviors like waiting or the, the postures, um, they later in their life can move up the ranks of dominance and become dominant birds. And then um, they may beat up on subordinates themselves. So I think that they're not born 
doing these things and that they develop through through the interactions early on during their life during their lives uh, granted i i guess that um probably that you know there is some degree of innateness in that when these interactions and dominance relations relationships are developing they know what to do um to some degree innately and and they may know how to give a submissive posture or know how to give um do aggressive behaviors and uh <clears throat> etc the next question is how do you determine the sex of chickadees at the feeder oh um that's another great question that i also suspected somebody might have out there and um essentially the best way to figure out the sex of a chickadee is by um genetics um taking a blood sample and looking at their their chromosomes but i did not do do that but pieced it together based on some uh, behavioral observations and for example um, it's only the males that sing uh, the Phoebe songs. And so if I observed a bird singing Phoebe songs, I, that would tell me that was a male. And also if I knew that um, a, a two particular individuals were paired together and I knew one of them was a male because they were singing by default the other one, um, is a is a female, yeah. so that's and, and sometimes in finding those the nests we would um, observe a bird to be incubating consistently, and so we would um, conclude that that was the female. And yeah, so that's that's main, uh, mainly it. I do have to say uh, to kind of expand on that. I I wanted to talk about this, but. Um, during the I, I'm going to cut in for a minute because we have 10 more questions. Okay, okay. And we're, we are at 740. So uh, let's see if we can answer yeah. as many of the questions as possible. Okay, oh, um, that sounds great. So this okay. next one is rather long. It's an anecdote. The person wrote, I visited Moose Bog last weekend. We were pretty much attacked by chickadees when we got out of the car at the parking lot. They proceeded to eat peanuts out of our hands for at least 10 minutes. Do you think it would be the more dominant or more submissive birds who were quote brave unquote enough to eat out of our hands? That's an incredible question, uh, and you know I would say you know based on what I talked about, you know essentially I don't know the the answer, and I say what I based on what I talked about. On the one hand, you might think you know the dominant would be getting you know, first dibs on that food, but also, like I said, the dominants um, are more risk adverse. Uh, but I suspect at places like Moose Bog with chickadees eating are very tame and eating out of people's hands that the dominant birds learn that humans are sa safe and it's safe to do so. And so um, it's, it's possibly, both. It's, it's probably um, both dominance and subordinates. I'm going to skip to uh, this question, which has to do with food. Are the more aggressive birds more likely to scold and approach humans when putting out food? Um, ah, I, I would say probably um, not. Uh, because as I was mentioning that um, the dominants are less likely to give alarm calls or they they usually they're not as good of alarm callers as the, the the subordinate birds so when if they are scolding or giving alarm call to a <clears throat> human it's probably more likely that it's the subordinate birds um, uh, but like you mentioned, they are, uh, birds are giving vocalizations like that to humans, 
um, that may be filling the bird feeder. Um, and so I've, I have no idea. It's a, it's a great question whether, you know, it, it's the uh, aggressive or dominant bird there. Like human, you better bring out that, get out that food. Uh, you will be able to answer this next one definitively. Okay. Um, the question is, do you have a picture of the nest holes that they create? And I know that we didn't see it in this presentation, but where would one be able to find those pictures? Oh, um, I do have pictures and, and vid video. I've taken some video of these birds excavating and uh, the cavities and it's it's a really fun thing to watch both the male and female participate and they kind of take turns going in the hole coming out with a beak full of what looks like sawdust and they fly off and spit it out and they just do it over and over again for days days on end um, and where um and actually i'm happy to show share that video i wish i had it really easy access and to show it now, but I, I don't. Um, um, but I'm happy to share that with whoever asked that question. Um, okay, great. Um, and this is a basic question. How do you tell a male from a female chickadee? Okay, um, and that, that's great. It goes along with how I told them apart, right? right? And it's a great question because um they look exact they look exactly the same to the human eye um but as it turns out chickadees uh don't see each other in the same ways that humans do chickadee vision and color vision is very different than human color vision or fairly different and especially because they see in the ultraviolet and so chickadees can actually tell each other apart very easily. They instantly recognize each other as male versus female. And, um, and researchers have used a special device to measure color called a spectrophotometer. And they have measured the color, uh, colors of male and female chickadees. And they find is that these areas, like the white on the chickadees, cheek is much brighter in the male than in the female and there's more ultraviolet in the black cap in the and in the bib um, and so they can tell each other apart not only are you generating excitement for chickadees but we've got questions um a plenty next do you <laughs> think do you think birds have become more aggressive as habitat shrinks and competition for territories increases? Oh God, that's a great question. But you only uh, well, have a minute. Yes, yeah. And I would say, yes, yeah, certainly the more competition, more birds that fit into the same space, um, there will be more conflict, more aggression, more fighting over that territorial space. Yeah. So here's the next one. Is there a possible disadvantage to the dominant flock members by relying on less experienced birds to do most of the alarming? Ah, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I sus my suspicion is that um, these less experienced birds are actually really good at detecting the predators. They, they, they know a predator when they, when they see it and that their, their warnings are very reliable, uh, I, I would say. One more question and then I will thank everybody involved. She asks, so at my feeder station, the chickadees come and go. How can I tell if it's the same five or so birds? Oh, and that's, that's the challenge that everybody has is knowing if it's the same birds or not. And that's, that's why it's very difficult to do so without having them banded. But some ways that you might be able to go about it is that you know, with 
a lot of the numbers of chickadees coming to the feeder that I was talking about. These are many different flocks and often the, the flocks can be coming from different directions. So if you're seeing birds come maybe out of the woods in one direction and, you know, going back and forth and then are, see some coming out of the woods on the other side, there's a good chance that those are separate, bir separate birds. Yeah. Nevertheless, there can be, could be, can be multiple flocks coming from the same, di same direction. So it's, it's a huge challenge. Well, you know what they say about those birds of a feather, and it's the same thing with bird watchers here in pandemic winter. I would like to thank both you, David Hoff, a member of the Otto Creek Board, Otto Creek for co-promoting us. Uh, we had a record number, 100 participants. That is also, just so everybody knows, in case somebody was not able to get into the program tonight, we have a limit of 100 participants. So my advice to you is next time, get in early and get into the waiting room. Now this presentation is being recorded and it will be on the Green Mountain Audubon website. And I believe that we will share it with the Audubon, with the Otter Creek Audubon and they can put it on theirs as well. I thank you very much. I learned more than I ever wanted to know. And now I'm gonna be looking at my chickadees and, and in a whole new light. Thank you one and all. Our next presentation, you can see it on the Green Mountain Audubon site. And I'm sure that Otter Creek as well has upcoming presentations. David, you did a fabulous job. We thank you. And good thank night. You. Thank everyone. you, Tom. And good thank night. you all for, for tuning in. And happy chickadees. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.